Thanks for the introduction, Paul. As Paul said, I'm going to focus on CLL um, today and what's learned about the molecular genetics of this disease uh, specifically. And it's uh, r really an honor to be here, particularly to honor uh, Drs. Moskowitz and Zelenitz, who have been incredibly supportive of me since my first days at Sloan Kettering. So um, I think this audience probably knows, needs no introduction to this disease, but just very briefly, this is a chronic B-cell malignancy characterized by accumulation of um, CD19, 5, CD23 positive lymphocytes um, in the peripheral blood, bone marrow, spleen, and other tissues. Now, the prevalence of CLL in the Western world um, combined with the easy access to the tumoral cells, which oftentimes are very much abundant in the peripheral blood, and their unique amino phenotype has really led to really tremendous genetic characterization of this disease. And so what I want to talk about today briefly is just to review what's been learned about the overall genetic characteristics of this disease in terms of the copy number alterations and mutations, and ironically how that's pointed to in the clinical experience the central importance actually of the B-cell receptor, almost independent of these mutations in this disorder. And throughout the way, despite how much we've learned about this disease and how much therapeutic progress we've made, there still, still really are a lot of unsolved mysteries in the pathogenesis of CLL, and I'm kind of highlight those um, throughout the talk. So as I was mentioning, a lot has been done and this disease, and this is a table of all of the whole genome and exome sequencing studies, at least the major ones that have been published in CLL. And so as you can see, there's been about 900 whole exomes and 250 whole genomes of CLL patients that have been published to date, mostly either by the International Cancer Genome Consortium, ICGC, or um, uh, the Kathy Wu and Gad Getz at the Broad. And so uh, to put in perspective overall, what do we know about CLL? This is a pretty famous um, plot that you see oftentimes data from the TCGA looking at all different kinds of cancers. And on the y-axis, the number of mutations and every dot being a single exome from one patient. This is where CLL falls. And so as you may have guessed, it has a rel it's on the low end of the scale of number of coding mutations per genome. Now interestingly, other forms of leukemia, which are kind of in general much more aggressive, ALL and AML, have even fewer mutations, surprisingly, than CLL patients. And this is where DLBCL, at least from the TCGA data, falls in. So in general, CLL has a paucity of coding region mutations. In addition to that, um, this is a table of the common uh, genetic alterations in patients with CLL um, as a histogram with the alterations seen here and the percentage of patients affected here from over 500 patient exomes. And the point here really is there are very few genes that are mutated in more than 10 percent of CLL patients. So the majority of patients with CLL have uh, mutations that really are not shared uh, beyond this first set of, of groups. The other thing to keep in mind is despite all the fancy exome genome sequencing that's been done, really the most common alterations in CLL are things we've known about for two, three decades. Copy number all, deletion in the 13Q, deletion in 11Q, trisomy 12 are amongst the top five most common alterations in, in CLL. Again, we've known about these for a long time and we've known about their clinical relevance so this is from in, uh, data from almost 20 years ago now, pre-BTK uh, uh, inhibitors and any other uh, targeted therapies. We've known that deletion 17P particularly associated poor outcome in CLL, as well as deletion 11Q, and DEL13Q um, being associated with, in general, improved outcome over normal karyotype. And what's also important about these copy number alterations is what do they actually target and why are they enriched in CLL? And the idea here is, trying to understand what do these deletions or amplifications, what genes are actually targeted by them. And so for DEL17P, we know at minimum it's targeting P53, DEL11Q at minimum ATM, but also other genes neighboring are also involved in the deletion commonly and also probably important in the disease, like this gene BRK3, important in NF-kappa B signaling. But one thing I like to highlight here is, you know, trisomy 12, a very common copy number alteration in CLL, present in around 10 percent of patients or so known about for a long time, we still really have no idea what trisomy 12 actually contributes to CLL and what genes or pathways are actually even pertinent to the enrichment of this alteration in CLL. The other thing, this is a story I always like to highlight, so the most common genetic abnormality in CLL overall is deletion of 13Q, and it doesn't even target a coding gene. It targets, we've learned now again a while ago known this, two microRNAs which importantly are important in silencing an antipeptotic protein, BCL2. And as many of you know, this has been even therapeutically important with targeting BCL2 now in CLL with venetoclax and other therapeutic strategies that are underway. And there have even been families as well as mice that have germline mutations in this microRNA that spontaneously develop CLL over time. 
It's a really a beautiful story linking this common alteration in CLL with the pathophysiology and even a, a relevant therapy in the disease. Now, by combining um, genome sequencing with identifying these copy number alterations, the other thing we've learned is that these common uh, cytogenetic abnormalities, DEL13Q, DEL11Q, and trisomy 12, are probably some of the very earliest events in CLL pathogenesis, and they predate a lot of the mutations, point mutations like in P53, ATM, or SF3B1, I'll mention in a minute, um, in patients with CLL, which tend to be intermediate or later events in the disease. We also now know that some of these copy number changes, they co-occur with other alterations or exclusive with them. So, for instance, DEL17P, we now know commonly on the remaining wild-type allele P53 is commonly mutated. So patients are finding ways to delete one copy and mutate the other copy. And the same is true with DEL11Q. In contrast, trisomy 12, again, a mystery, seems to be relatively exclusive with DEL11Q and DEL13Q. Reasons for that, again, we don't really know why. Now, in terms of point mutations, this is something that's come out over the last um, five to ten years in CLL, is that there are a lot of genes and pathways that are mutated in cells with CLL, as shown here, and I highlight in red here the common ones. And again, for maybe for P53 and ATM, we understand their contribution to the disease, but many of these other ones we still really don't, and I want to highlight very briefly this one, SF3B1, um, firstly because it's common in CLL, it's one of the top three commonly mutated genes in CLL, and it tends to be associated with adverse prognosis, even independent of other prognosticators in patients with CLL. It's very interesting because it's part of the RNA splicing complex. It's important for RNA splicing in all cells. The mutations occur as uh, heterozygous point mutations of very specific residues, suggesting that they're activating. Um, and what's kind of learned about them today, many papers in the last year have come out. They suggest the following. So we know that splicing normally should occur at a specific 3 prime splice site, as shown here. But cells with SF31 mutations tend to utilize an aberrant 3 prime splice site, about 10 to 30 base pairs upstream in the canonical 3 prime splice site. The importance of this is about at least one third of the time, these mRNAs are not going to be effectively produced in the protein properly. Now, why this is linked to CLL, what this has to do with CLL, I think we have no idea yet, um, but it's really an important area of active investigation. The other kind of mystery with SF3B1 is that, again, it's associated with adverse outcome in CLL, but it's also in, very common in patients with myelodysplastic syndromes, the exact same point mutation. And in MDS, it's associated with good outcome. Why is that? Why is the same mutation basically only enriched in these two diseases amongst other ca cancers and have different outcomes and so forth? Again, important questions that are being investigated now um, moving forward. So I mentioned the adverse prognosis of sf 3 one mutations in CLL. We also know, of course, P53 mutations, even independent of deletion of P53 associated with adverse outcome. And this paper published last year also found now a new mutation that's associated with adverse outcome in CLL in a ribosomal protein. Like the SF31 mutations, it happens at a specific point mutation, and why a ribosomal protein mutation we found in CLL patients and contributed to the disease is an open question uh, and under investigation. The other thing I'll note, really interesting um, information that's come out of sequencing of CLL patients, this cartoon that Kathy Wu had provided in the editorial, is that we know that CLL patients, they don't exist with a single clone. All of them virtually have multiple subclones that are genetically distinct, having some shared mutations present in the patient. And that these populations actually change over time with progression of disease or treatment. And so sequencing a patient with CLL at one time point actually may not tell you what's actually happening to that patient over time. And this has been a really um, important topic that's been learned from sequencing these patients. Now, coming back to this figure about the mutations in CLL relative to other cancers, again, we've noticed here that there's a paucity relatively of mutations in CLL compared to other diseases. And that's led to a lot of hypotheses about the disease. Um, and so one, there's two kind of ideas that are kind of going around now. The one is that mutations in CLL that we're identifying, maybe besides P53 and ATM, really don't contribute to the disease. Maybe actually CLL is instead driven by an aberrant B cell receptor um, and or abnormal interactions of this receptor with the environment, and the mutations maybe don't matter at all. The other idea is that maybe it's actually the non-coding genome, this is all within the coding genome, the parts of, of genes that, course, you know, produce protein, 
then maybe there's alterations to the epigenome or non-coding genome that are important in CLL that we just don't know about yet. Um, so to this first point, I'll talk about first and the second. So this first point, this is interesting data, ICGC. They sequenced 150 whole genomes, and this is a so-called Manhattan plot from their paper. And so what they're highlighting here is mutations in non-coding genomes near genes. And some of these are noise, like probably the immunoglobulin genes are probably related to this AID that happens in CLL cells. But they did point out one thing that looked really interesting, it, mutations in an enhancer that probably regulates the transcription factor PAX5. And so this is from their paper, the red triangles are mutations in individual CLL patients that are far from any gene and actually kilobases away from the gene coding for PAX5. But it seems that they affect an enhancer, a part of the genome that regulates expression of this and ba basically eradicate this, downregulate PAX5 expression, somehow maybe promoting CLL pathogenesis. And really the point of this is that there's probably a lot happening in the genome of CLL patients that has nothing to do with coding genes but may impact their expression and may actually be contributing to the disease um, strongly. There have been other eff efforts to try to understand this, and I'll just highlight a little bit of our own work ongoing now. So a number of DNA methylation studies have been completed in CLL um, over the last five years, and there has been one recent study, only one, looking at chromatin state, the histone modifications in patients with CLL. And so uh, Dan Landau has recently moved to Cornell. We've been collaborating with him, and we developed a data set now of patients, small number, 15 patients with CLL, but an exquisite amount of data, RNA sequencing, DNA methylation sequencing, chip sequencing for important histone modifications and whole exome sequencing, all in these same samples. And we're trying basically to integrate these data, and I won't talk about what this is, to discover what are the important regulatory regions in CLL, and how is CLL actually different than other normal B cells? And we put this data together, and again, we'll talk about these in these maps of the genome, self-organizing maps, where these little honeycombs, each of which are many parts of the genome collapsed together, that act similarly in terms of chromatin state. And I'll just show you two slides of this data um, briefly here. So looking at parts of the genome that are, look like transcriptional start sites based on this data, you can see naive B cells, germinal center B cells and just two representative CLL patients, they look pretty similar, okay? So the actual genes that are turned on in terms of transcription start sites, pretty uniform. If we look at enhancers, though, we start to see really different picture. So we can see here that there are some parts of the genome that are actually specific to normal B cells, germinal center as well as naive B cells, and really aren't turned on, if you will, in CLL cells. Conversely, we're seeing parts of the genome in uh, CLL patients, which appear to be specific to CLL and not present in <coughs> normal B cell subsets. And I'll just show you an example. We'll zoom in on this little honeycomb and all the um, people here and focus on just the H3K27 chip seq data. And you can see here uh, three patients with CLL versus two, a germinal center B cell and naive B cell sample. Large amount of this enhancer coded by this mark, marking this transcription factor ID3 in the CLLs, which are not seen in these uh, normal B cell subsets. And this is just one example, probably of hundreds or thousands, of genes which are differentially regulated in CLL compared to normal B cell subsets. And so we're digging into this data now further to try to understand um, the disease in, in terms of what's happening in non-coding regions. Now the other part of the story, again, besides mutations and coding genes, is what about the B cell receptor? And this has been really a compelling story, of course. We've heard about it today, and we'll hear more about the impressive response of CLL to um, therapies targeting the B cell receptor. And we've also known from sequencing, though, that the B cell receptor in CLL patients are actually pretty abnormal. These patients show a skewed repertoire of immunoglobulin and heavy chain genes based on their sequencing and highly stereotyped and quasi-identical antigen binding sequences. So you could have two patients with CLL, different parts of the world, that have nearly identical B cell receptors how is that happening? That's not random. And it really is suggesting that there's something about that that's driving the disease. Um, and so some people have hypothesized that this is evidence that, you know, maybe there's these receptors are aberrant, they recognize abnormal antigens or self-antigens, and that actually selects for CLL cells and causes the disease. And it's not the mutations that are really doing anything. And these copy number changes, they contribute something, but this is actually the central driver in the disease. That's one hypothesis. Um, still ongoing currently. And of course, this has actually some correlates to some of the really important clinical variables we've known about. So for a long time, it's been known 
that one of the strongest prognostic variables in CLL is the mutational status of immunoglobulin um, heavy chain genes. So those patients that are unmutating having very distinct adverse prognosis than those that are mutated. And this has been shown many times, and it is independent even of the common copy number changes in CLL patients. In addition, uh, we had data set from our patients here. We know that those that are IGHD unmutated actually tend to have more mutations in general on average than those that are mutated. And that brings me to kind of the second to last ongoing, still unanswered question with CLL, which has been hypothesized that maybe the IGHD mutated and unmutated CLLs are actually distinct. They're coming maybe from different cells of origin, potentially. And this is a cartoon that hypothesized this from a review several years ago, suggesting that they you know, always are thought to be derived from a post-germinal center B cell, but maybe actually the mutated and unmutated are coming from different subsets, and maybe that's why they seem to be different. They histologically and the immunophenotype is identical, but maybe they're actually two separate phases of the disease. The other question that has been raised recently is that maybe a cell much prior to a committed B cell actually gives rise to the disease, and that's been investigated by looking at mutations in cells before the B cell compartment in CLL, and there's a little bit of data maybe favoring that, but also some data against it now as well. And so uh, this is actually my last slide, and just to bring up this point that one very fascinating part about this disease that has been known for a long time, again, we still don't quite understand, is that we know that CLL is rare in East Asia, China, Korea, Japan, and it remains rare in people from those areas that move to the Western world. Moreover, the first degree relatives of people with CLL, they have a three to eightfold increased risk of CLL. So these data all really suggest that there must be some germline susceptibility to the disease. There have been uh, a number of studies, both GWAS studies and individual family studies of familial CLL that have tried to investigate this, but in general, there still isn't, except for some individual families, a very clear explanation for the familial predisposition to CLL, and I, hopefully that'll be something that we're enlightened on um, in the near future. So with that, basically to summarize, um, what we've learned thus far with all this data from CLL patients is that there is a comprehensive catalog, I do believe, of the somatic coding region alterations in CLL patients. The copy number changes have been known about for decades, and none of that changed with exome or genome sequencing. The mutations have been, you know, there's an increasing list, but those that are mutated and shared amongst at least 10% of CLL patients is basically just this list. There is maybe clinical utility for these, but we have a lot of prognostic material and variables in CLL, and where these fall in that hierarchy, it's not entirely clear that they're so valuable. Um, but one area that definitely, hopefully, we want to learn about more is how do these alterations actually functionally contribute to the disease? We talked about SF3B1 in that context, but also NOTCH1 and the trisomy 12. And understanding the contribution and alterations in the non-coding genome and epigenome uh, to CLL development, I think, will be a very important area over the next few years. And lastly, again, the B cell receptor and its central importance learned from therapeutic studies is clearly established in CLL. Um, and then the very last thing is trying to understand further the germline susceptibility. So with that, I want to give thanks. Really, again, want to highlight the um, help and support over the years from Craig and Andy, um, who are really important, even career mentors, as, and I was a fellow. And I'm part of the leukemia service, but they've remained really important mentors for me as well over the years. So thank you so much. Pax five uh, is that a real effect? I mean, do we, you know, we we, we know CD twenty and the, the, you know immunoglobulin expression is certain things are, but you know, typically downregulated. Uh, do you know? Do you have any sense what what that uh, may affect? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I'm going to be honest. That's the data from the ICGC from their paper. How that actually function contributes to CLL was not really touched in their paper. Does it actually contribute? Do these mutations or kilobases away? It's a nice hypothesis. I don't. I wouldn't bet my life on that relationship, to be honest with you. I think that's maybe what you're suggesting as well. But it is an example of a region where there's recurrent mutations clustered together in CLL patients, and that's above and beyond chance. So it must be doing something. Pax five could be it. It's a very good hypothesis, but there's not very strong data linking them. So it's a good question. All right, well, thank you, thank you, yeah.